A reading from the Edgerton Gospel. Just then, a leper comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, Jesus, in wandering around with lepers and eating with them in the inn, I became a leper myself. If you want to, I'll be made clean. The master said to him, Okay, you're clean. And at once his leprosy vanished from him. Jesus says to him, Go and have the priests examine your skin. Then offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded and no more sinning. The legal experts came to him and they interrogate him, putting him to the test. They ask, Teacher, Jesus, we know that you're from God, since the things you do put you above all the prophets. Tell us then, is it permissible to pay taxes to the rulers? Should we pay them or not? Jesus knew what they were up to and he became indignant. Then he said to them, Why do you pay me lip service and call me teacher, but do not do what I say? How accurately Isaiah prophesied about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart stays far away from me. Their worship is empty because they insist on teachings that are mere human commandments. A gospel inspired by God. <clears throat> Hi, Anna. How you doing? Good. It's good to see you. Hi, Alex. I love a good detective story, but the kind of detective story that I really love isn't about cops and robbers trying to find out who done it. I'm much more interested in great detective stories where scholars of antiquity find some artifact and then they try to figure out and piece together where is it from, when was it created, by whom, under what kinds of circumstances. And so this morning, as I was reading this gospel, <coughs> I began to think about this. It's called the Edgerton Gospel. Probably most of us have never heard of the Edgerton Gospel. So let me give you a little bit of background to it. It's the Edgerton Gospel is just a, little, a few bunches of scraps of papyrus which were found in Egypt in 1934. And they were bought by the British Museum. And the guy who funded buying them is a guy called Edgerton, which is why it's called Edgerton Gospel. Edgerton didn't write it. Edgerton, Edgerton is the Englishman who funded it being bought by the British Museum. And very unusually for the Times, having got it and acquired it in 1934, they published it almost immediately. 1935 it was published, which is really unusual. Often these things take 50 or 60 years before they reach publication. But it was published within a year. And it's a gospel and there are no known sources. It's never referenced anyplace else. Many of the other gospels that we found even recently we knew they were referred to in other ancient writings. This one is not referred to in any other writing. There's no precedent for it whatsoever. And basically, it consists of just four little stories. Three of them are found in the other Gospels, and one is found no place else. There's a story in there about Jesus doing a healing at the Jordan and tying it up to a parable about setting seeds. He's putting the two together. So it's a very interesting little piece. And so they're trying to figure out when it came from, and they carbon date it. And they figure out it's from about the year 200 AD. But now carbon dating isn't really precise. There's a difference in science between, between precise and accurate. So it's accurate to say I'm between five feet and seven feet. But it's precise to say I'm six feet one and a half. So there's a difference in science. So it's not completely precise. There's plus or minus 50 years. So maybe it was from 150 AD or maybe from 250 AD. And so the scholars are trying to figure out, can we narrow it down even further? There's any way of narrowing it down. And they're beating their heads to find out what it is. And then all of a sudden, in 1987, in the University of Cologne in Germany, there's another little papyrus and a scholar is examining it. And he suddenly realizes that the contours of this little piece 
actually mesh completely with the contours of one of the pages on the Edgerton Gospel over in London. And he figures it out, he gets the two of them together, puts them together, they fit absolutely perfectly. Moreover, the narrative flows perfectly. It's part of the same story. And then the clue. In this little piece that came from the university in Cologne, there is an apostrophe, a single apostrophe. And the scholars say, we got it. Now we can date it really accurately. Because apostrophes only come into Greek orthography after the year 200 AD. Before that, they'd never used apostrophes. So now they figured out immediately. We know now it wasn't 150 AD, it was between 200 and 250 AD. So I love when that kind of stuff happens. It's an extraordinary human ability to figure stuff out like this. And so as I was reading through these reasons this morning, the first one, the second one, and the third one, I, each of them is speaking about healings, about physicians, about pharmacists, and about healers. And I want to do my own little piece of detective work there because I'm finding at the moment that I'm coming across a lot of illness and a lot of serious illness, people with very serious illnesses at the moment. And they're trying to wrestle, trying to make sense of these kinds of things. And that's what I want to address again. And I revisit some topics I've hit in the past as well. So I make five main points this morning. The first one I will talk, I will talk about the allopathic med model of medicine. Then I'm going to talk about energy medicines. Then I'm going to talk about six-factored illness. Then I'm going to talk about six steps toward healing. And then finally, back to basics. So there are the five points I made this morning. So when I was reading to Su when I was hearing Susan read this morning, I don't know if you were paying attention, at the end of the reading, instead of saying, this is a reading inspired by God, I felt like saying, this is a reading inspired by the American Medical Association. <laughs> It's a hymn in praise of physicians. That's what it is. And it goes back to Sirach, an Old Testament story. And so it really could have been a hymn written by the AMA. So very, very interesting. And what I begin to realize is that mainly in the world in which we live, what tends to happen is this. Certainly in Western society, we spend billions and billions of dollars getting overweight and vegging out. And then we spend more billions and billions of dollars trying to lose weight and trying to deal with the consequences of vegging out. What we want is a pill. We're not interested in change. We're interested in being better. So we go to our physicians typically and we expect the physicians to work miracles. We want them to heal us, but we don't want to do anything different ourselves. And so Western medicine has evolved in response to that kind of need. And Western medicine has its great strengths. It is excellent when it comes to surgery, brilliant when it comes to surgery, absolutely fabulous when it comes to dealing with infectious diseases, has a pretty pathetic record when it comes to chronic illnesses. We're no nearer now cutting down cancer rates than we were 50 years ago. So the chronic illnesses we're not making any impact on. And part of the reason is the attitude of people who just want to get better but they don't want to change. And part of it is that allopathic medicine, when you just look at what it means, allopathic literally means treating something with its opposite. That's what allopathy means. Pathy is the disease, allo is opposite. So you treat a disease with something that's opposite to it. In other words, what are you doing? You're repressing symptomology. That's the object of the exercise. You come in with a particular symptom and we want to get rid of the symptom. So that's part of the problem with the allopathic model of medicine. A second problem, in my opinion, is this, that it doesn't really have a theory of wellness. It has a theory of illness. And by default, Wellness is defined as the absence of illness. It's a pathetic model of wellness. There is no model of wellness. And then even the model of illness, in my opinion, is really inadequate. It's not really examining most of the reasons for illness. It's looking just at etiology. And there's a lot more to illness than etiology. And I'll talk about that in a few moments as well. So that's my first point. That's just a very brief look at how we expect our Western physicians to heal us and how they respond to this. However, there's a tradition on planet Earth, and a very ancient one, this isn't just recently, of a different kind of response. This is my second point, and I call it energy medicine. And it's predicated, in my opinion, on very, very ancient understandings of the human body. In the West, we're impoverished again because we think the, the, the body is a whizzy wig. What you see is what you get. We're just this physical stuff that you see or that our instrument can pick up on. But in many different uh, regions of the world, there are very different models of body. 
including the Hindu model that suggests there are seven different levels to us. But I want to just look at the second level in the Hindu model. It's called the etheric body, or the energy body. And the belief system in many parts of the world and in many ancient civilizations was that there is an energy body which lies behind our physical articulation or our physical manifestation. It's almost like it is the blueprint that created the house of your physical body. And so before there was a physical body, there was a blueprint. There was an energy template created by God or by whoever that led to your physicalization eventually. And all illness starts in that place. And therefore, to be trying to treat the building when the problem is with the blueprint, it's not going to get you anywhere. If you built a house and the upstairs apartment keeps collapsing down into the bottom and you keep trying to shore it up, putting extra pillars on it, and you don't go back to the blueprint and you realize, oh my God, we made a mistake in the blueprint. The blueprint called for X and we put in Y. That's why it keeps falling down. So very, very often what we keep doing is we keep trying to shore up something that's collapsing because there's a fault in the blueprint and we haven't gone back to the blueprint and we haven't examined the blueprint. Now the blueprint, what's called the etheric body, is both the origin for the creation of the physical body and the sustenance and the main maintenance of the physical body. So it didn't just bring it into being, it's in charge also of its maintenance and its ongoing health. And so medical models that ignore that do it at their peril. They cannot deliver real quality of health to us. Now, there are many, many, many different energy models. You know, there's acupuncture, but um, I want to just focus on one of them today just to give you an idea of what it would look like if we had a different philosophy of health and healing and a different understanding of what body would look like. So let me just take homeopathy as a case in point. Homeopathy is a system of medicine that was devised by a German physician, a man called Samuel Hahnemann, uh, in the late 1700s. He was trained as a Western physician, but over the course of his life as a physician, he realized he was doing as much harm as he was doing good. People really weren't getting better. And he began to seriously rethink his model of uh, healing. And one of the things he noticed is that when, when a little baby is developing in, in utero, it follows in the following way. It develops what's called proximodistally and cephalocaudally. In other words, cephalocaudally, it develops from the head down as the embryo is developing, it develops from the head downwards, and distally, proximo distally, it develops from the inside toward the outside. So all life operates in that fashion. It develops cephalocaudally and proximo distally. And he figured out healing probably happens in the same way. And he figured out that illness happens in the opposite fashion way. That illness tends to start at the outside and work its way inside. And what he began to see was that symptoms are actually evidence that the body or the psyche are trying to heal themselves. So all symptomology is proof that the system is trying to rectify the imbalance. But instead we see the symptom as the problem, so we repress the symptom. So what he said was this, illness happens in three stages, as does healing. Illness always begins on the outside with physical symptomology, and if our response to it is that we shut down the symptoms, then the body will try to manifest a different physical symptom, and we shut that down. And finally says, the illness has no place to go except in. And so it next attacks the emotional body. And then we begin to uh, elicit all kinds of emotion symptoms. And what do we do with those? We shut those down, we repress those. I don't like this kind of behavior, let's shut this one down. And it tries with a different emotional symptom, and we shut that down with medications. And finally, it has no place else to go except right into the core. And he called the core the mental slash spiritual body. Now it goes into the mental arena, and now we are, we're in big, big doo-doo. So he says, what happens if instead of shutting down symptomology, we listened to the symptoms, and we began to amplify them and accelerate them? And the example I'd like to use is like, it's almost as suppose you had a huge, big estate. And you've looked at this huge wall around your estate to make sure there are no intruders. And you've got this very sophisticated surveillance system, and there are cameras on the walls. And inside in your bedroom, you've got a console. And if somebody approaches the outside wall, a light goes off, and a noise goes off, alerting you that there's somebody at the outside wall. And then at the wall of your house, there's a second system. If they've managed to get over the wall, and they're at the wall of your house, there's a second light that goes on, and a second signal that says beep, 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 intruder outside your house. And then the third one is, if there's somebody at the door of your bedroom, a third light goes on and a third noise goes off. Now imagine you've got such a system, and the light goes off, the noise goes off, 
telling you there's an intruder outside your gate. And you're really annoyed at the noise and the blinking light, you can't go to sleep, so you turn off the button so it doesn't blink anymore or make any more noise. And 10 minutes later, the second one goes off and it's blinking and making this loud, noxious noise, indicating there's somebody right outside your house. And this is really annoying to you, so you turn off that one as well so you can get back to sleep. And then finally, the third one goes off really loud and this noise and this flashing goes off, indicating there's somebody right outside your bedroom door. This is really annoying to you, this third light, so you turn that one off. And then the guy comes in and he kills you. Now basically, that's what's happening here. As long as we keep shutting down the warning lights instead of attending to what the system is trying to tell us, then we're just driving the illness deeper and deeper and deeper. So his belief system was that when you start healing somebody, the healing starts happening from the inside out. Which is why, for instance, if somebody has a spiritual or a mental crisis, as they begin to get better, there are going to be emotional symptoms because the illness is working its way back out through the system. And as the emotional health begins to improve, there'll be physical symptoms manifest. You're going to break out in pimples or something. Toxicity, that's the body getting rid of the toxins. This was his model. And he began to figure out a whole new system. That's why he, he called it homeopathy. It was based on the adage, similia similibus curenter, like cures like, which is where we get homeopathy as distinct from allopathy. So instead of treating something with the opposite, you treat it with the same thing. So I began to wonder if somebody had a particular kind of symptom and you were to regard this as evidence that the body is actually healing itself, and instead of shutting down the symptom, could you amplify it and accelerate it so the healing could move through the system more quickly? How would you go about doing that? So he started setting up tests. He started taking natural substances from the natural world, minerals and vegetables of various kinds and, and even animal products, and he began testing. He would take 50 volunteers and give them a micro dosage. Let's say, for an example, the bark of the chinchona tree. And he gives somebody a little piece of this bark to chew on. And within two or three days, they're all journaling, and they all report they're nauseous, they're breaking out in fevers, they have joint pains, their head is spinning around, these are all the symptoms associated with malaria. And so you say, aha. So chinchona bark is a substance such that if you give it to a well person, it will create all the symptoms that somebody with malaria has. Therefore, if somebody comes to me with malaria and I give them this, it will amplify and accelerate what's happening. And that's exactly what happened. The only known cure still for malaria is the quinine that comes from the chinchona tree. All of the other pharmaceutical agents with malaria has developed and changed in various ways that they don't work anymore. This is the only one that continues to work. Because as it says in the first reading, nature has gifted us with everything we need to be healthy human beings. There's a reason that human beings live on planet Earth. There's a reason that we evolved on planet Earth, because planet Earth contains all of the ingredients human beings need to be truly healthy. And when we know how to look at our environment and to take from our environment, all the healing is there and all the cures are available. There's this beautiful passage, I don't know if you caught it in the first reading, where it says, the tree converts the power of water. Now, what does that mean? It means that you've got a tree sitting in the soil and it's searching among the nutrients in the ground and it's soaking up what's of value to it and it turns the water of the soil into the juice of the apple. That's what it means. And that's what healing is about. The place of the physician, or the healer, is the ability to cast about in nature's apothecary and to draw from it all those elements which are being gifted us by nature because she created us to live on planet Earth so that we can begin to experience the juice of the fruit. This is what it looks like. So that was, there were the conclusions he came to. He further figured out that uh, this homeopathic treatment was better if it was really dilute. So he started a process called succussion. Succussion is this, you take um, juice from some element, which is a healing agent, and you put it in water, in lots of water, and you dilute it, and you succuss it. You really shake it like crazy until it's really distributed throughout the, the, the water. And then you take a single little dropper, and you take one drop, and you drop it into another five gallon container of pure water. And then you succuss that completely until it totally dissolves throughout the water. And then you take a single drop of that one, and you break it to a third container, another five gallon, and you drop a single piece. And you keep doing that, or you've gone way beyond Avogadro's number. 
Avogadro's number is a number in chemistry. It's 10 to the power of minus 23. And it's such that if you dissolve anything beyond that number, it means there's not even a single molecule of the original substance left in the dilution. And then he said, no, that's the most powerful healing of all. Because you're not dealing with a biochemical interaction, you're dealing with an energetic transfer. He talked talk about, he called it this, this signature of the substance, rather than the biochemistry of it. And if you go to any, any good um, homeopathic store, there are very different kinds of powers. You'll see C's and M's, which means they're diluted thousands of times or just hundreds of times. And the more dilute they are, the more powerful they are. If you're a homeopath, you don't give a very dilute substance to somebody unless they're really, really sick, you give a less dilute form to it. So this is another system of medicine, a system that honors the fact that human beings evolved on this planet, and we evolved together. All life forms evolve in tandem, and therefore everything we need to live truly functional, loving lives, it is there when we know how to use it. So that's my second point. My third point is this then. Six-factored illness. When you read about you know, theories of illness, they go all the ways from you know, very simplistic models like micro uh, microbes are the cause of all illnesses, all the ways to kind of new age stuff that says it's all your own fault, why did you make this happen? So very simplistic solutions. Illness is at least a six-factored equation in my opinion. And the six factors are these. The first factor is genetic predisposition. Every single one of us as individuals, we have particular weak places. Every one of us comes from a family, and as families, we tend to have weak spaces. You know, there are some families who are more prone to cancers, other families are more prone to diabetes, others maybe to heart diseases. And so the family we come from is part of our gene pool. And it's true also of different tribal groups or ethnic groups. There are some ethnic groups who are much more likely to develop, to develop particular kinds of illnesses than others. And so the genetic predisposition is the realization that as individuals, as members of a family, and members of an ethnic group, we are more or less likely to develop particular kinds of illnesses. So that's one ingredient. We have to look at that piece. That's important. That's profiling the, the, the client. The second piece is to look at the environment in which we were raised and which we live. This is a huge factor. And by environment, I mean everything from the in utero experience of the developing fetus what was it like in there when the child was growing? Was a mother really stressed? Was she nurtured well? What was the environment like in there? What was the quality of my birthing? Was I delivered by forceps, cesarean section? How did I come out? What kind of family was I born into? Did we have adequate food? Or, you know, what was the cultural trance in which I lived? What was the belief systems in which I lived? So environment is very, very, very important in the quality of our health and the quality of the illnesses we get. That's the second factor. A third factor for me is personal lifestyle. We have a huge impact on the quality of our own health by the way in which we live. And primarily this happens in the following ways. It happens through the sleep quality we get. Do we get enough sleep, good sleep or not? The exercise regimen, are we really exercising, using our bodies as a gift from God or just vegging out completely? And our diet, what kind of food are we putting into our systems? So these three are really important. But also how we feed our minds. Because the fourth factor, in my opinion, is personal belief systems. So how are we feeding our minds? Because if uh, physiologically we are what we eat, then mentally we are what we feed our minds. So what's the quality of our entertainment, our TV viewing, our reading, our thinking? What kinds of stuff are we dealing with? Are they toxic ideas? Are they nurturing ideas? That's the fourth personal belief system. And particularly in personal belief system, what do I believe around illness and healing? Who heals me? Who makes me uh, sick? So does sickness just happen randomly? Or do I cause it to some extent? And who heals me? Is it just a doctor with a white coat? Is it the pill? Is it just the surgery? Or do I have any control about the rate of my own healing process? Those belief systems are huge. The fifth factor, I believe, is karma. In any one lifetime, I am dealing with, at subsequent stages of any lifetime, I'm dealing with the results of decisions I've made and lifestyle I've lived in earlier periods of my lifetime. And so I can't just attribute the illness at this stage of my life to what's happening right there. It may have begun 25 years ago because of diet or exercise or whatever it is. So they're always connected. And the same thing is true in a reincarnational aspect as far as I'm concerned. 
Sometimes illnesses we're experiencing in this lifetime are the residue of lifestyle we've lived in other lifetimes. We get a chance to repair it in this lifetime. That's a fifth factor. And the sixth factor, I call it the bodhisattva factor. There's a great, you know the teaching in Buddhism that uh, some enlightened beings who don't need to reincarnate, they come back for the sake of the rest of us. They come back in order to, pre, to be an example that we too may be free from the illusions of maya. But they don't need to do it. Now, all of us, to some extent, are bodhisattvas. To the extent that we can act with compassion and with altruism, we're exercising the bodhisattvic dimension. And so, in my opinion, there are some instances in which a person, not realizing it right now, but volunteered for a mission in which they would have a particular kind of illness in order to offer other people the opportunity of exercising compassion, or the scientific community the opportunity of studying a disease and helping to find a cure. So that would be the bodhisattva dimension. Now when we look at these six pieces, they break up, break up into three categories. The first two, genetics and environment, this is really the purview of science. Science can help us figure out how to deal with genetic issues and environmental concerns. Number three and four, personal lifestyle and personal belief systems, they are totally our own. We have absolute control over these factors ourselves. And there's no healing happens without radical changes in these two pieces. And the last two, karma and the bodhisattva, they are part of our mission. That's a totally different factor. And I will talk about that in the next section. So that's my third point. Next one, then, I want to talk about six steps towards healing. So what do we do if we're alive, awake human beings, and we find ourselves in a situation of unhealth or illness or whatever, what are the steps we might begin to take? In my opinion, the first step is meditation. And I don't mean you just go off and navel gaze for 30 years and that'll make you better. I mean that you really introspect really, really deeply. And by introspect, I don't mean just go to the core of your physical being. I mean you go to the core of your inner essence, which is the God part of you. And you ask two questions there. What is the cause of this illness? And that's not the most important question. Second question is the most important. What is the purpose of this illness? Because there's a difference between cause and purpose. Cause is merely etiology. It's the things, you know, genetic predisposition, etc., that may have led to this. Purpose is very different. Purpose is karma, or purpose is bodhisattva vow. And so before I attempt any kind of healing on myself, or on anybody else, I have to fine-tune that for myself. What is the cause of this illness, and what is the purpose of this illness? And again and again and again, when I watch Jesus healing, he's making this discernment time after time after time. There are times in Christ's life when he doesn't even attempt a healing. Why is it that there's only about maybe four episodes in the Gospels where Jesus raises somebody from the dead. He lived at a time in Galilee when the life expectancy of a Galilean male was 29. He obviously came across a lot of dead people and a lot of dead young people. Why did he choose to raise only three or four of them? There must have been tens of thousands of lepers. There's instances in the Gospel where maybe he cured 50 or 60. So there's the discernment process. Christ, as a great healer, will try to figure out not just what is the cause of this illness, but what is the purpose of this illness? And if the purpose is for a bodhisattva vow or for karma, he will not attempt a healing, and any great healer won't. Because to do that is to take you out of alignment with your very purpose for being here. So that's the first step. First step is the meditation to discern the cause and the purpose of an illness. Second step, in my opinion, then, is prayer. And by prayer, I don't mean you say to God, please, please make me better. You know, I'll go to Mass every day for the rest of my life if you can get rid of this cancer. That's not prayer. Prayer is focused, laserized intentionality. It is the understanding that we are all interconnected with each other and that healing flows through us to each other. So we're not asking some distant demanding deity to intervene and change the course of world history or our personal sickness. We are plugged in to this system where we're all connected. Prayer is about that kind of laserized, focused intentionality. That's step two. Step three is action. Now that I've meditated, I think I've figured out I know what the causes are, I know what the purpose of this is, and I've really prayed, I've focused and laserized my intentionality, I've activated um, others. Now, action is, I've got to begin doing something about it. And there's the great um, Islamic proverb that says, pray to God, but first, tie up your camel. In other words, don't expect God to do everything for you. Now, avail yourself of your physicians and your healers of various kinds, start making lifestyle changes, start changing your thinking. So you've got to start doing stuff now that'll make the healing possible. That's stage three. And stage four is 
working with the outcome. Whatever the outcome is, you've meditated, you've prayed, you've done your best, you've contacted all your resources, now there's a particular kind of outcome. You have to work with the outcome. That doesn't mean you have to say, okay, I give up, it didn't happen, I'm stuck. No, it means that this was the outcome right now. Can I stay totally focused in the now and take it from here? Try something else perhaps? So working in the now is step four. Step five is, I now go back to meditation to try to fine tune. As the result of having prayed and acted and worked with the outcome, I can now fine tune and find out have I really understood the causes of this and the purpose of it, so I may have to fine tune and readjust my model. And stage six is equally important. Stage six is the realization that I can't lose. There is no way I can lose. If the reason for my illness was for personal lifestyle or personal belief systems, then I can change and make myself better. If the reason for the illness was karma or bodhisattva vow, that is my mission, and then I need to come into alignment with my mission. So whichever way I do it, I can't lose, because I'm in alignment with the reason for which I came. So for me, that's, those are the steps of the healing process. Which brings me finally to my fifth point, a simple one. I call it back to basics. So what do you do when you're trying to intervene in healing somebody or healing yourself? I want to take a very simplistic model. Just imagine there are only three levels to you. There's a physical level to you, there's a mental level to you, and there's a spiritual level to you. Then you need to go back to the basics on all three. What am I doing physically that's not helping? And what might I do differently that would help? So for instance, am I getting enough sleep? Is it good quality sleep? Or have I been watching TV for the last three hours before I went to bed and it's all these murder mysteries and I spend my whole night with these weird dreams and I can't sleep? So what's the quality of my sleep? Am I getting enough sleep? Giving myself enough time? What is the quality of my exercise? Am I literally sitting in front of a TV with a remote control in one hand and a beer in the other? Is that how I spend my time? Or am I cycling or swimming or whatever? Am I exercising regularly? I can change that. And what's the quality of my diet? What kind of stuff am I putting into my body? So that's the basics. Going back to physical basics would be those three pieces. Mental basics would be this. What is the quality of the nourishment I'm giving to my mind? What kind of books or magazines am I reading? What kind of TV programs am I watching? <coughs> what kind of conversations am I having? What kind of thoughts am I entertaining? Because if the TV and the magazines and the books I'm reading are about violence and injustices, and if the quality of that is what I'm feeding my mind, then certainly I'm going to be an ill person. Because certainly, mentally, we are what we think. What we put in here, gunk in, gunk out. So I can begin changing. For instance, shoot my TV, or start reading really good literature, or delving into great ideas, join a book club, something that exercises and feeds my mind. And then thirdly, a basic is, how is my spiritual life? <clears throat> How am I treating my spiritual body? So what am I feeding there? And I would suggest two pieces to this. That we have to examine and reject all of the toxicity of fundamentalist kind of religious thinking. Anything that divides us from each other. Anything that says there's a chosen people. There's the sinners and there are the elect. There's heaven and there's hell. There are the bad guys and we're the good guys. Anything, any religious system that divides us from each other, that needs to be rejected. And we need to create models of religion and spirituality, economic models, political models, educational models, agricultural models that totally recognize that we are only one. Models that tell us you must love your neighbor because your neighbor is yourself. You have to love your enemy because your enemy is your shadow self. You have to have compassion for all living beings because they're just other digits on the hand of the same guide who's your father and who's your mother. And most importantly of all, perhaps, it is the ecology of healing, the realization <clears throat> that all of these pieces are interconnected. You can't have one piece without the other. That all of these fit together like the crossword puzzle. They fit together like the page in the Edgerton Gospel with the piece from the University of Cologne. Absolutely perfect fit. They tell the good news when they're put together. And the good news is that we are all totally connected. There will be no healing, no significant healing for any one of us as long as the system itself is not interconnected and ecologically sound. John Donne said famously one time, no man is an island. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. He's not just talking about death, he's talking about life and he's talking about illness. If a single
cliffside slides into the ocean off the wild west coast of Ireland, all of Europe is impoverished because of it. <laughs>